Thanks, Steve. I appreciate I'm standing between you and a beer, or you're standing between me and a beer, so we will get straight into it. Um, I've caught the tail session a few sessions today, and obviously the threat of lack of efficacy from crop protection products is very real. Our last couple of speakers talking about resistance. Plenty of data, fabulous looking curves, and as a scientist, I love it. It looks great. But then we hear the muck and mystery about deregistration, the threat of reg regulatory pressures, what's going on overseas with some of the other regulators. So my objective here is to give you a fairly high-scale overview about what the chemical review process is in Australia and what maybe some of the implications are and to just get a bit more understanding around how it all works. So we'll start with the take-home messages, then if you're a bit tired, you can have a snooze for 10 minutes afterwards. First thing, have confidence the Australian system is science-based. There are pretty curves behind, there is data behind. It is a well internationally regarded science-based system. Um, when it comes to products being nominated for review, or reconsideration is the other word that's often used, um, it is based on some key selection criteria, going back to that scientific uh, evidence-based process. And as I've got there, and they're pretty much in order of priority probably, that criteria is around human health, toxicology, oh and um, the environment, residues, trade, so can we continue to trade with our main trading partners for that commodity, crop safety and efficacy. Um, you guys as growers, advisors, the rest of us in the industry, how can we actually influence what's going on in this space? Well, primarily it's around responsible use of those products, i.e. follow the label. It's there for a purpose. And if we're not following the label, we're going to put, our, put the spotlight on our industry and on these products. Whether that spotlight is through environmental risks, you know, we hear about the reef all the time, um, whether it's through human health. You know, following the label is the most responsible thing that we can do as an industry to safeguard the use of these products and the future use. So um, a little bit of background, a little bit, I guess, about the APVMA. How does something get registered other than all the science and, and data behind it? What the APVMA is focused on is satisfying that the intended use doesn't harm the health, the safety of people, animals, crops, environment and trade. That's their overriding charter, I guess. And that's done through that evidence-based evaluation of actives and products. But in doing that, they take into consideration the way that those risks and hazards can be managed or mitigated through directions for use on the label. So those do not state, do not do statements on a label. They're there for a reason, not just to make our life difficult. All right. Um, Understanding also that the Australian system, North American system, including Canada, are all, as it says there, risk assessment based. And that risk assessment is hazard and exposure assessment, and the two go in tandem. The EU, Europe, has tended to move towards simply hazard assessments. And my favourite analogy here is x-rays. So to you or me, x-rays are very hazardous. You know, you get zapped with a high dose of x-ray, you're in big trouble. But to you and I, the exposure risk is very limited. Unless we break our arm every second week, we may only get x-rayed a couple of times in our life. If you're like me, every three years when I finally remember to go to the dentist. But the old mate who's taking those x-rays, his exposure risk is huge. Hence he hides behind the big wall with the three inches of lead and the glass and the apron and everything else. So our system combines those two. The other one I love is coffee. You know, coffee is, is by ARAC a, a class one carcinogen. If you drink enough of it, it's very bad for you. But hey, the half a dozen I have a day, I'm sure, are quite safe. So the review program, um, how are things uh, targeted? What does the APVMA consider? It's about, we've already had something registered Maybe it's been registered for five years, maybe it's been registered for 30 years, but new credible scientific knowledge has come to light. And that new knowledge could be around any of those points there. 
and the, I've underlined that word credible. They're looking at credible, peer-reviewed science around the world. Potential outcomes from a review? Well, it could be that the use pattern is confirmed as being safe and appropriate. Good, clean scorecard, and that does happen. It could be that there's a restriction to the use of the labels, so our, our use patterns, how many crops, or rates, otherwise may be curtailed, and that's also happened, of course. Or the, the final point, which is basically that something is withdrawn. It's no longer available, it's deregistered. That may be mandated, it may be voluntarily withdrawn by the company. Uh, again, a little bit of history. So the review process has actually been going on for just over 20 years. And in that process, and remembering, sorry, that the review is not just ag chemicals, it's also veterinary chemicals. Um, so there's been 63 reviews completed. Only 10 of those actually impacted or were for compounds used by broadacre grains. And the, um, the results of those 10 reviews, well, we lost two products. Many of you remember endosulfan, I certainly do, and um, fenthion as the other one. We had four products with amended labels, significant amendments to the labels, so atrazine, dimethoate, diuron, and omethoate. So that was around the way we could use them, but we were able to retain them in, this, in the system. And five, there was actually no changes, so they got a, got a clean scorecard from a broad acre use pattern. Horticulture, other things maybe have been removed, some of those. So generally speaking, the broadacre industry, our grains industry scorecards, doing all right. Sorry, I'll go back to that one because I forgot the last little bit there. I threw those glyphosate figures on because I'm sure it's a, a hot topic amongst you all over a beer tonight. And without entering into all the politics and everything that's going on, just to explain that glyphosate went under a complete review by the APVMA, which was completed in 1996. And other than some claims around aquatic uses and aquatic waterways, it basically retained its label. We've all heard about the IRAC report, which was released at the end of 2015, where they've classed glyphosate as a class 2A carcinogen. Um, what else is a 2A? Red meat. Um, any hot drink over 65 degrees C. So, you know, you've got to put these things, my x-ray example, put it in perspective. The APVMA, of course, looked at that work. It's their charter and their responsibility. And they determined that they still uh, not believe. The data supports the fact that glyphosate is still safe to use as per the directions for use. And at the moment, they have no plan to re-review glyphosate. And I'll explain in a minute what the review process is and where some of the actors are at. So um, how's, uh, what have I got there? Oh, yeah. How are they nominated for review? Well, again, it's on those principles. Human health, environment, residues and trade. Crop safety and efficacy aren't that big a concern for the APVMA, to be frank. I mean, let's be honest, if you were selling an, a crop protection product, you're probably not going to make false claims about what it does or doesn't do or what it's not safe to what crops. That's called shooting yourself in the foot. So they're a bit more interested in the, in the top three. Okay, mandatory table, which hopefully nobody can read. You've got to have one in every presentation I was taught. But if I can get the pointer to work, these, um, uh, what have I got, 10 I think on the left, are currently under review. So they are active reviews that the APVMA is undertaking. And of interest to you is probably things like 2,4-D, uh, diquat, fipronil, what else? Paraquat, prosimidone, if you're a pulse grower. The ones, twos, and threes are the, are the highlighted issues for those actives. And they are all around public health, worker safety, and environment. Um, this group in the middle, so we've then got something like 19, if you combine both of these groups, they are the ones which have been nominated for reconsideration or review in the future. These five have been prioritised in order of priority. So the next cab off the rank will be the diethycarbonates, so Mancozeb, Thyram. These ones haven't even been prioritised yet and will not be until these are started in the, in the review process. Um, 
chlorthalonol. What else have we got in there? The triazole. So there's some pretty important active groups there for us. But you'll see in a minute some of the timelines. And as an example, I said dithiocarbonates are the next cab off the rank. The expectation is that review will probably start in 2020. And it'll take anywhere from three to five years. The legislation says the reviews have to be completed within five years now. Um, so when will any of these actually get to the point of being reviewed? I'm not even going to hazard a guess. It is a lengthy process. So let's not start jumping at too many shadows. A uh, bit of an example, so 2,4-D is probably the other one that's pretty uh, hot topic at the moment. So that review actually started in 2003. Uh, it was determined that mainly it's going to, whilst public health is an issue, mainly it was the environmental side that the APVMO was particularly concerned about. Um, that, uh, what else have we got? That's probably all on that one. So in 2005, there was some additional instructions added to the label around drift and environmental protection, and that's where the coarse droplet requirement became into vogue with, with, uh, with 2,4-D. Um, the way that all that roughly works, oh, sorry, then we go to 2006, where high volatile esters formulations were identified as being a particular concern from an environmental drift point of view. So the way the APVMA often handles this is that they um, rescind or remove the existing labels and put a permit in place stipulating certain use patterns or conditions of continued use. Sound familiar to what happened in October last year? Um, so as an industry, we have a chance under that permit to demonstrate that we can do things responsibly because the science has dictated that that permit should protect the environment. However, if it doesn't, either because we as an industry are incapable of doing so, or the science didn't support it ultimately, then um, the use is removed. So high volatile esters were actually removed from registration in 2013, leaving us with the LVEs. And doesn't that sound very familiar about what's just happened in 2018? We've got the new permit in place, uh, very coarse droplet requirements, a few other conditions. Here's our opportunity as an industry to demonstrate that we can play the game and do the right thing. I mentioned dithiocarbonates as priority one. Uh, just very quickly, as part of that priority setting, what the APFMA is looking for is what are the key issues? What are the key concerns? So for these guys, it's around the toxicological risk of things like mancozeb. Um, they're known to be a thyroid um, to toxin. Dietary exposure is a consideration. Now, they're used on a lot of horticultural crops, which we consume a lot. So what's the bioaccumulation within us and within the system? Um, and uh, the labels are very old. They're very old products. So what was the science and the rigour when those products were being registered and developed? And there's deficiencies in the labels around repeat applications and that sort of thing. They also take into consideration the stakeholders' perspective, so the industry's perspective. So they're, they're highly important pest management products, particularly in horticulture at the moment. They're very important to, to your pulse growers and, and clients from a, from a disease and IPM management point of view. And that the stakeholders say, well, we, we believe we re need to retain access to these. So can we retain access in a safe and responsible way with the current labels, or do the labels need amending? Is what sort of thing that will come out of the reviews. They also look at overseas, of course. So Canada has just finished their review of the dithiocarbonates. And unfortunately, the scorecard's not great. And the expectation is that for Mancozeb, it'll probably be deregistered. There's a revised report that everybody's waiting on to, to, for that decision to be made. Thyram will probably be deregistered, at least for foliar uses. We mainly use as a seed dressing, so that could be a, could be a bonus for us. And the other, other couple of ones as well, most likely be deregistered. So when this 2020 starts, review starts, that sort of other knowledge will come into play and be considered. Um, as an industry, we probably should be preparing ourselves. Where do we go next if we do lose it? The other mandatory uh, table, which, oh, you can probably read this one. So carbendism, so these are the 10 ag, broadacre ag products which have been through review 
which had those outcomes that I listed in the three points. So as an example there, carbendazin that I've highlighted. So all horticultural use patterns were removed. Horticulture lost the use to it because of exposure and the, 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 the hazard, uh, the assessment of, of exposure and risk. Um, however, broad acre, yep, it was retained because we sit in nice air conditioned cabs with activated charcoal filters and, and we don't have the exposure, same exposure risk. But there was re-entry re -entry intervals added to the label and a few other statements. The other one down the bottom I wanted to touch on, because I've taken a few phone calls on this one, is omethoate. So when it went through the review, it actually lost all use patterns except for bare earth border spraying. So you couldn't actually use, I'll say LEMAT, because we all know what LEMAT is, within the field where the crop was being grown. The reason I then get the phone calls is that actually now LEMAT is re-registered for use in winter cereals and canola and pulses. And people say, well, hang on a bloody minute. It was deregistered, except for that one use pattern. What the heck's going on? Well, what happened was that um, the company that now owns it, Arista, owns the brand LEMAT, invested in the necessary data, the residue studies for winter cereals, canola, winter pulses and pastures to satisfy the APVMA that the use pattern is good, that, that it meets the re requirements. So they made that investment, not inconsiderable investment, which got the product use pattern back there for that one brand. We won't go into all the hoo-hahs about data protection and the fairness or inequity of the system, that's the way it is. They made the investment, therefore they have the label. So by rights, you should only be using LEMAT, not, not any other demethoate. You're contravening the label if it's not actually physically on the label. Um, couple other things, because we all like big numbers. Cost of registration, it just continues to skyrocket. The estimate at the moment is that only one in 106,000 actives that are identified, a bit like um, our variety screening numbers, will make it to the marketplace. One in very, not, ma not many. Cost 1995, about 150 million US to bring a new active through that pipeline, which takes anywhere from 10 to 15 years. Uh, 2015 was estimated at 286 million. So the cost of bringing new stuff to market is huge. You all know that, you see that reflected in the drum price when you buy a proprietary branded new product. And we all scream about how expensive they are and yeah, maybe rightly so, input cost versus productivity. But now overlay that with product defence of an active that's 20 or more years old. Every man his dog out there can go to China and formulate it and import it and sell it for two bob six. And we need to, or somebody needs to invest millions of dollars regenerating all that data. It might be a third, even up to half of the original tox package, environmental package, to retain an active in our marketplace where there's 30 competing businesses or 30 other brands there that we may buy. Who's going to do that investment? Simple answer is nobody, because they'll never get their money back. So we see products not being defended when they come under review. Um, so some of the, the space where GRDC is starting to work, um, one of them is this, um, other than keeping a dialogue with the APVMA, knowing what's coming, likes of the dithiocarbonate thing to say, if we lose it, do we have things to, to plug the holes with? What are the needs? Um, Developing a threat, or well, maintaining a threat matrix, basically. So looking at actives around the world, what's going on in other regulatory systems, to try and have some forward focus about what the oncoming threats are to the Australian industry. So the uh, conclusions at the end, if we're going to maintain access to ag chemicals for broadacre, it's very, as an industry, growers, advisors, resellers, we, we really do need to show good, strong leadership and that's about using them according to label. Um, I've spent plenty of time advising growers and often, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, between you, me and the gatepost, I know you can do this and I'll get you out of the hole that you're in. It was always in a very considered opinion though about the product, the crop, the commodity, the market, and I don't do nudge, nudge, wink, wink anymore because it's just too damn risky. So that's that strong stewardship. And I've said it plenty of times, 
actually following the label is really the most influence you can have. Jumping up and down and saying, we desperately need this product, we can't afford to lose this product, doesn't work. The APVMA is not swayed by economic argument. It's about safety, it's about data, it's about science. So doing the right thing. And if you really want to you know, put yourself to sleep, there's plenty of information on their website about the actives, what the issues are, what's being done, where they're at with timelines and everything else. And Steve, that'll do me, mate. Thank you very much, Gordon.